I'm not going to go with the microphone in your row four. Oh, ten. So just move here. Так, значит, нет, you see? I'm a very authoritative person here, yeah. Так, значит, сегодня у нас очередная внеплановая лекция, серия внеплановых. Спасибо, спасибо Денису Лавкину. И сегодня профессор Эмма Тилинг расскажет нам историю летучих мышей, которые стали вдруг актуальным созданием из-за этого самого, из-за того, что на них сейчас вешают всех собак в связи с этим самым вирусом. Хотя, в общем, я не знаю, сказать, как она будет про это рассказывать или нет. Неважно. Значит, сегодня значит, Эмма, Тилинг, Эмма Тилинг расскажет нам про секреты генома летучих мышей. Эмма, thank you for coming and we are looking forward to the pleasure of your lecture. So I'm going to go up on the stage. So before I start, does anybody know, and you have to stay quiet, what species of bat that is? Anybody want to hazard a guess? Those are fingers. They're the fingers of one of my very first PhD student. No, not a vampire. It's Crassionictus thonglangii, or the bumblebee bat, caught in Thailand, and it's arguably the smallest mammal in the world. I know the shrew biologists will fight with the bat biologists, but I think we are correct. But what I would want to do today, and, and thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to come and speak with you, is I want to tell you about the work that I've been doing over the past 10 years, studying bats to understand what mechanisms they've evolved to slow down the aging process. And I've been studying bats in many different guises now for probably 25 years, trying to understand their evolutionary history, sequencing their genes, trying to look at their genomes, and really trying to understand the unique adaptations that bats have. Of all mammals, they're the most extraordinary. They're the only mammals that have achieved the ability of true self-powered flight. They are a very strange immune system that allows them potentially tolerate viruses like the coronavirus that other mammals can't live with. So they've evolved unique mechanisms. They're the only mammals that can orient in complete darkness using sound alone. They also use echolocation. But the one thing about bats that not that many people know about, unless you're working with the bat biologists who've been catching them, ringing them, and recapturing them. Indeed, some amazing projects have been going on in Russia and in Siberia. And we'll talk a little bit about these mark recapture projects and how much information that we as biologists can get from these type of studies is that they live for a ridiculously long time, given their body size. And that the work that I've been doing in the past 10 years is trying to understand what bats have evolved to allow them to slow down this aging process. And I'll be talking about that today. But I want to ask you the first question. So what actually is aging? What's aging? So let's all think about it. It's a process that we all actually can see. You can see an old dog. You can see an old cat. You can see an old human. It's probably one of the best known biological processes. But what's unknown is what goes wrong, what drives the aging process. So there's so many different theories out there about why aging happens. Is it evolutionary basis or not? But one of the definitions of aging that I like is one where it says that it's a process of intrinsic, progressive, and generalized physical deterioration that occurs over time, beginning at about the age of reproductive maturity. Now, what that means is that you hit puberty, and then you start to die. It's quite depressive. But one of the reasons why understanding the aging process is difficult is that it is inherently complex. So let's look at these different hallmarks of aging. So they've over years, researchers have categorized these hallmarks into kind of nine broad areas. This is a famous paper by Lopez Otin. So things that go wrong, your genome becomes unstable. Your telomeres shorten with age. You have these epigenetic alterations that happen on each one of the cells. You get a loss of proteostasis, so your ability to maintain functional proteins or remove them slows down. You have these dysregulated nutrient sensing. 
Mitochondria, the, uh, the powerhouses in our cells, they, start, they stop functioning as we age as well. Your cells become old. What does senescent mean? You have stem cell exhaustion and also this altered intercellular communication. And these are these broad sweeps. But the question that we ask ourselves is, are these the drivers of aging or are they the result of aging? How can we tear these apart? So why do we even need to understand this aging process? Well, we really have to start to understand aging a little bit better because we, we have a problem at the moment. And the problem is that people everywhere are living longer. The World Health Organization has estimated that in 30 years' time, there's going to be a 380% increase in people over the age of 80 and a doubling in people over the age of 60. And while that seems wonderful, so even though our longevity, our lifespans are now extended, the problem is that our health spans have stayed the same. So our probability of acquiring disease of the old age by the time we are 60 has stayed the same. So even though all our populations are living longer, you still are not able, to, you're still suffering the ill effects of aging by the time you're 60. So right now there's our current lifespan in yellow, our expected increase in lifespan on the top, but the onset of the age-related diseases is still at the same time. Now what that means is that if we don't find a way to understand the aging process better with a view to find mechanisms to alleviate it, not stop it, to alleviate it, our future generations are going to be full of the incapacitated elderly. And what that means, if you think about it, it's going to cost so much for us to try and maintain older people into a longer lifespan. Because they've estimated in the US alone if we can somehow slow down the aging process by two years, they've estimated that you can save seven trillion US dollars over a 50 year period. So aging costs money. Now we need to find ways to understand aging, to understand how can we increase our health span to match our lifespan. The question is which type of future do we want? Do we want this one? Or do we want this one? Now, it's a little facetious, but the point is that wouldn't be so much better that if we could match our health spans to our lifespan, and society would be much more productive. You can never change the age of menopause yet in women. That doesn't really happen. Now, what do we know about the, the longest lived human? Well, if you read the Bible, apparently it was Methuselah. Methuselah was supposed to be the longest lived individual. He was supposed to live a total of 969 years, not suffering illness, and then suddenly he died. But that's the type of idea that we do actually want to think about, extending our health span. But the oldest known individual human is Jeanne Calment. She was French. She lived till she was 122 and 167 days. She smoked till she was 117. She ate chocolate every single day. She drank red wine and port. So she did all the things you're not supposed to do. She didn't suffer illness. She went blind at about 112, and she lost her hearing at about 115. But everything else was still functioning. And the super centurions seemed to have what Matusa was supposed to have. They don't get sick. And then when they get sick, they die. But they have a long, long life of a long health span. But what do we know about aging? How are you supposed to study aging? Let's think about it. There's been wonderful insights into how things age. And these are based on model organisms. So typically aging is done, studying aging is done by looking at the health of an individual when they're born and seeing how it changes over their lifespan. And they do this in model organisms. And by doing this, by working with the likes of nematodes and flies and mice, what we found is that the aging process, actually, it's, it's regulated the same way across these different board groups of animals. And that's a good thing. That means that if we understand aging in one species, potentially we could translate it into another species. So we've learned a lot about the studying of aging by our lab organisms. But it's really bothered me. And if you think about it, everything that we are trying, we're trying to study aging with a view to finding ways to extend our health span. 
by studying organisms that are really, really good at dying and really bad at living. We picked these model organisms because you could study them generation after generation in a lab within our lifetime. And so really, the question is, can you translate what you find in these short-lived, typically inbred organisms to the likes of us? And as a zoologist, I like to say that there's more to life than rats and flies. And that really, if you want to understand what are the mechanisms behind longer health spans, you need to study species that have naturally evolved longer health spans. And the species that hold the record is this beauty. These are bats. And again, one in five of every living mammal is a bat. And they have extraordinary, unusual adaptations. And one of them is their ability to somehow resist aging. So this is, I suppose, a, a paper that I read by Steve Ousted in 2010 that really stimulated and drove this research. And in nature, typically there's a law. Small things live fast and they die young. Think of a mouse, think of a shrew. They don't live longer really than four years, six weeks, four years. Big things live slow and live long. Think of a bowhead whale living over 200 years. So there's a correlation between body size and maximum longevity. And typically it scales on a one-to-one -one correlation. But this is done, so this is a longevity, longevity ratio, which is a ratio of the expected lifespan, given body size, to actual uh, lifespan. And what you find in most of these 668 animals, it correlates. But what you have here is this group in red, which are the bats. And the bats are living up to 10 times longer than expected given their body size. So there's 19 species of mammal that live longer than humans given their body size, based on this 2010 paper. 18 of these are bats. Does anybody know what that other weird blue dot up there is? It's a naked mole rat. They also are doing something very extraordinary, weird biology, a rodent living 10 times longer than expected. So, but we've got close to 1,400 species of bats. And the majority of them, when they're studied with their mark recapture mechanisms, are living way longer than expected. The bat that lives the shortest length of actual chronological time is Molossus molossus, that we have on record. Its maximum lifespan is four years, but still, that is what would be expected given its body size. So bats have evolved some weird mechanisms. And the question is, what are the mechanisms that underlie their extended health spans? And this bat is Myotis brantii. And I was quite excited by coming to Siberia because it was um, the Russian bat biologists with their mark recapture projects had found that this species holds a longevity record for all bats. So it was caught as an adult, an adult male, and the published paper says it was caught 41 years later. Perfectly fine, not looking sick. No gray hairs. And I believe that I found it's been caught now 43 years later. They keep catching this bat. He's not dying. Now, what's weird is not that we have a bat that's living over 41 years, because, again, we don't know how old it was when, when it was caught. But is that the fact that it can live this long, given the fact it only weighs 7 grams, which means that's a third of a lab mouse. So it's doing something extraordinary. And these myotis bats... These are the longest lived of all of the longest lived bats, these genera. So what I got very interested in was trying to understand, well, what have bats evolved that allow them to defy this aging process? And how are we going to study them? And so it was something that really, really intrigued me. What are the natural mechanisms that bats have evolved? How can they slow down aging? Now, to address this question, which has really driven me insane for a very long time, I wrote a European Research Council grant, and I was able to design a project whereby we could study wild bats in an aging context to try and uncover the molecular mechanisms that they've evolved. And I'm going to show you a movie and talk you through it. Now, if you want to try and study bats in an aging process, the longest lived bats, we cannot keep them in captivity. The insectivorous bats that live here a very long time, our husbandry is no good. Bats will only have one baby every year. They're not a good lab bat. 
So if we wanted to be able to study the bats in an aging context, I had to be able to catch the same bat year after year after year and take a sample that wouldn't kill them, that was biologically re relevant to the aging process. Also, we had to try and find, I needed to know the age of these bats. Now, the only way you can age a bat is that when they're born, their finger bones are not fused. And so you catch them, you spread open their wings, you, sh you shine a torch underneath the wings, and if you see a gap between the finger bones, you know they're less than one. After a year, sometimes even after six weeks, if they're grown fast, those gaps close and you can't age the bat. So to age a bat, what you have to do is catch them as a baby, put, in a, put on a ring or a, a microchip now, and then release that bat, and then you catch it again, and you realize, well, I caught that bat as a baby in 2010. I've caught that same individual now in 2020. That individual is 10 years of age. And so what I had to do is we had to find a population of the long-lived bats that we could catch year after year after year that we knew the age. And thankfully enough, I had a PhD student when he was a postdoc in my lab, the guys whose fingers were on Krauss Nicterus, Sebastian Pouchemail. He was working with this French conservation organization called Brittany Vivante, and the French love their wildlife. And they've been studying this population of long-lived myotis myotis bats for 20 years. And they had been ringing them, they've been putting in microchips since 2010. And these bats were the long-lived bats, but that were large enough that we could take samples. And I'm going to show you. So we found this population in France. And the bats live in these beautiful old churches and cathedrals. And working with Britannia Vivant, this volunteer organization, my lab, we go from Ireland over to France, drive with a mobile lab. What we do is we catch the entire colony over a month. And the colony is found in five different churches over about a 40 kilometer radius of Myotis Myotis. We catch them, we weigh them, we take a three millimeter wing punch, we take less than 140 microliters of blood that you can see from their ankle bone, as you can see here. We take microbiome swab. Uh, Britannia Vivant to work to see what's the health of the bat, what's the weight of the bat. Um, we take all of these data, and we've been doing this now for the past 10 years. The idea is that we want to be able to catch known, known aged individuals, take a blood sample, because blood is an overall proxy for the overall health of organisms, and actually you'll find 60 to 80% of all protein transcripts are found in blood. We wanted to try and look at different biomarkers in aging. And so what we do is we catch them, we then release and we feed them. And um, long-lived animals are very cross. They will bite you if they can. We've had no fatalities yet. And so every year we have collected samples from these long-lived bats and we want to look at what are the changes that happened as these bats age from young to middle to old age. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to look at a whole bunch of different types of biomarkers of aging. And there were molecular assays that were designed to work on humans and mice. So we had to adapt them to work on bats. And the first markers we looked at were the telomeres. So if you remember from... Biology 101, telomeres are the repetitive ends on your chromosomes, TTA, GGG, that shorten with age every time your cell replicates. We want to look at the mitochondria, look at the powerhouse of cell, bats of a really high metabolic rate. Have they evolved mechanisms to somehow limit the deleterious side effects and the free radicals produced by this high molecular uh, metabolism or high, me high metabolic rate? We want to look at the overall blood transcript down. Look at all of the genes that are expressed in bats' blood and see how this expression changes. Do bats experience the same level of dysregulation in their aging process as we do, or have they evolved some other way to deal with it? We want to look at their overall microbiome. As you age, the gut, the bacteria in your gut changes, and supposedly this contributes to the aging process. Do bats have a way to slow that down or, or do deal with it differently? We want to look at autophagy, their ability to remove damage as they age, remove cellular and protein damage. Again, as we age, our ability to remove the damage decreases. And also want to look at their innate immunity. Again, was there some correlation between bats' unusual immune system 
and their ability to live for, for, for a long time. What was going on? Do bats experience the same level of age-induced inflammation that we experience? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you an example of how we designed our assays with the telomeres and then talk you to the results of the other parts. So let's remind ourselves about what our telomeres are. They're the TTA, GG, repeats at the ends of all of our chromosomes. Essentially, they're like the aglets on the end of a shoelace. And again, as we know, you can't lengthen these at the five prime end, or it's not that common. And then every time your cell replicates, it gets shorter and shorter and shorter. And eventually they get so short that this signals to the cell that it needs to die, essentially. It needs to be removed, or it sits there and it becomes senescent. It can't replicate anymore. Now, when the cell becomes senescent, it's not a good thing because it alters also this signaling. And it becomes these really zombie-like cells that cannot, they don't have their, their self-destruct suicide uh, mode stops. And they'll emit SASP, and then they'll attract healthier young cells to them and turn them into old cells. So it's supposed to drive the aging process. There's loads of companies now in California trying to find ways to remove these senescent cells. So the question is, in these long-lived bats, do they have a way to maintain their telomeres or not? So to do this, we modified a QPCR assay designed by Cawthorn to work on humans, whereby you compared your TTAGG repeat to a single copy gene. And we worked out the process, optimized it for bats. And the idea was that if a bat had a long telomere, you'd find a signal at the early stages of your QPCR. If it had a short one, you find it at the later stages, and it was relative. We were not able to be able to work out these actual direct. So apparently you can do this and really work out real size. It never worked for us. So all we could do was this relative. So we did this, and we did this for our myotis myotis bats. And my brilliant PhD student at the time, Nicole Foley, who led this charge, so she started to present the results, showing that from a non-lethal wing punch, you could estimate telomere length in bats. And we'd present this at the bat meetings, and suddenly the bat biologists who were doing all these micro capture projects says, hey, we, we want to come in. We want to join you. So we were studying myotis myotis bats, one species in France. There were these other group of people who had been studying these long-lived bats in the UK, in Germany, for over 60 years. And they said, hey, we want, we, we'll catch the samples. We'll take wing punches and send them to you, and you tell us what's going on with the telomeres. So we were able to look at myotis myotis bats. We had 239 of those. We looked at myotis becksteini, work done in Greichfeld in Germany by Gerald Kurtz. We worked with these long-lived rhinolophus from Aquinum in the UK. Roger Ransom has been studying these bats himself for 60 years. And we knew the age of them. And also this micro capture project that was running on this long-lived miniopterus in Portugal. So what did we find? What's our results? Well, our results are, first of all, to make any of this work, you need longitudinal marker capture field study. So when people talk about this aging process, particularly molecular biologists and genomicists, my other hat, you got to work with the biologists. And also you need to think of what are these methods that we can do. So you have to modify methods that are just optimized for human and mice to work in our non-model organisms. So when we did this, we found something that was quite extraordinary. In the longest-lived genera of bats, the myotis bats, so we had myotis myotis and myotis becksteini, their telomeres did not shorten with age. Now, this is quite unusual because in most species they do. Now, any bird biologist might question that, but in all mammals to date, they shorten. What we found is we asked the question, well, what's going on? Was this as a result of the fact that bats were expressing telomerase? So if you think about it, in your germline cells, you're able to extend your telomeres because you express telomerase. And that's fine in germline cells, but in any somatic cell that's expressing telomerase typically is a cancer cell. Bats don't get cancer. So their telomeres weren't shortening, but we asked the question, is this because they're expressing telomerase? Have they evolved mechanisms to deal with telomerase without getting cancer? So to do this, we went and we looked in our blood transcriptome, did we have any evidence of telomerase? We couldn't find any tert. We then sent the paper for review, and the reviewer said, hey, wait a minute. You can't look at blood cells and then look at wing cells. You have to go and look at wing fibroblasts. 
So we took our wing cells, we grew fibroblasts, and we tried to see, could you find the expression of telomerase when we had this wing fibroblast culture? You couldn't. So it looked like bats were somehow extending the length of their telomeres, these long-lived myotis bats, without expressing telomerase. So to try and understand what mechanisms allow the bats to do this, we then spent the past six years, should have only been six weeks, mining all the mammal genomes that were out there and trying to look at 442 different proteins that are involved in telomere maintenance, like the sheltering proteins. We lined them all up. We used this evolutionary selection analysis to try and see could we find any of those genes that were under selection in bats that may be led and pointed at what are the mechanism that bats have evolved to allow them extend their telomeres. We did all this, and after FDR correction, we found two two potential candidate genes. One is um, MYC, or SETX and ATM, looked like they were evolving different on the branch that led to the myotis bats, and that maybe these were allowing bats, these genes, these proteins were working in a different way that allowed bats to extend their telomeres. And what's interesting in both of these proteins are directly involved in this alternative telomere lengthening pathway, and maybe that's what they're doing. But we need to think about now verifying those results. So in these long-lived bats, their telomeres, they're not, they're, they're not shortening in the long-lived myotis bats. We also looked at the mitochondria. Again, think about this free radical theory of aging. Mitochondria produce a whole bunch of free radicals that then in turn breaks up the mitochondria. And that as we age, our mitochondria become more and more and more decrepit. So the question was, when we wanted to sequence that mitochondria, so we sequenced the whole population of mitochondria in our bat cells. And what we found, we want to compare what was the damage that you would see. What, and we, wanted, we looked at damage to assess whether or not these mitochondria were becoming more and more heteroplasmic. More evidence of mutations. And were these mutations as a result of free radical oxidative damage? So we sequenced that for young, middle-aged, and older bats. And what we found when we did that was that bats did not experience the level of damage that would be expected given their oxygen consumption and their free radical output. So this meant that potentially they have evolved mechanisms to repair that damage or to remove the damage. And this is a paper that came out that really questions this free radical theory of aging. So they're doing something different. Again, it was David Jeb who led that charge. But then it's something else, and I want to talk to you guys about this. We'll come back to, I need some help in making this part of this project work a bit better, and I think that maybe you guys can help me. We also looked at their innate immune response. And so the idea is that have bats evolved some weird innate immune response that allows them dampen the constant inflammation they should be experiencing due to their high metabolic rate. And what we did was, originally, we, were able, we, can, we can grow fibroblasts from the wing punches. What we wanted to do was grow bat cells, challenge them with LPS or IPC, which are these immune agonists, and look at their QP, QPCO response, looking at the cytokines they expressed, to try and see, would bats have a predominant anti-inflammatory response to an immune agonist? And so we did this for the fibroblasts, and we couldn't get it to work. And I spoke with my immunologists who were our collaborators and said, you need immune cells. You need macrophages. And how do you get macrophages from a bat? So at that time, so in our populations, one, a baby was born, had an injury, and had lost her wing. And the mother was still feeding this bat, and she was a large adult-sized bat now, but was never going to be able to fly. And so we were able to get a permit to euthanize the bat. Because remember, in Europe, they're all protected. And we euthanized the bat, and we took long bones, we took the finger bones, we took the, the, the leg bones, brought it to my collaborator's lab in Ireland with Luke O'Neill, and they flushed out the bone marrow. And so you had stem cells in the bone marrow, and we were then able to stimulate those cells and turn them into macrophages using this mice stimulating factor. It's very conserved. So we had macrophages, and we had living bat immune cells in the lab. We then challenged them with poly-IC and LPS. We designed this QPCR assay. We wanted to see whether or not what happens when bats have an infection. So this is in the lab. 
And what it looks like is what happens is, and we compare them with mice, with the wild type mouse, wild type lab mouse. And what happened was very quickly they mount a highly aggressive anti-inflammatory -infl reaction. And then very quickly they dampen that with this anti-inflammatory reaction. When you compare them overall and you look at the ratio of um, inflammatory to anti-inflammatory cytokines, what it looks like is if you look here in the mice, mice have way more of the pro-inflammatory, whereas bats have way more anti-inflammatory. So their IL-10 to TNF is really, really high in the bats versus the mice. Now, what this means is that potentially when they are infected with a pathogen, such as a virus, such as a coronavirus, they're able to somehow modulate their immune system to very quickly neutralize it and then very quickly throttle that inflammation. And what is known that people who are dying of coronavirus die of the flu. The reason why you die is your own inflammatory response. So bats potentially have evolved mechanisms to stop that. Now I hypothesize it's because of flight. And lots of trouble over this. But then if you think about it, flight is so unbelievably metabolically costly. It's a very unusual form of locomotion. They consume the highest level of oxygen and they're producing um, lots and lots of free radicals. So potentially they've had to evolve mechanisms to deal with this. And what this means is that bats should be experience this constant inflammation. To deal with this constant inflammation, they've had to evolve mechanisms to dampen this. So that means that they suffer the sterile inflammation all the time. They've evolved mechanisms to counteract that. And that means when they're exposed to a pathogen, they behave in the same way. And what this results in is that the side effect is that they live much longer because the aging process really is driven by inflammation. It's one big hallmark of aging. And also they can carry all of these pathogens. So it's a hypothesis. We've tried to repeat this. We've tried to repeat this over and over again. The problem is it's very difficult to get the samples. We tried to do it with fruit bats. And what happened was we were not able to isolate the bone marrow, the stem cells from the bone marrow, because it seemed to be in adult bats, they're very, very fatty. There's fat in the bone marrow. So anybody who's been working, any of the, the people working in karyotypes, potentially you guys know how to work with non-model organisms. And I think that we have a technical problem in how to do this. So this was an amazing result, but our sample size is n equals to one. So we need to test this across the different species. So maybe this explains bats' unique immunity. And remember, they're supposed to be reservoirs for Ebola, for SARS, for MERS, potentially rabies, for Marburg. They do carry these. We have evidence that we can find evidence of them not suffering ill effects from having these infections. So they've had to evolve unique mechanisms. So we also looked at their microbiome. This was the one thing that the French, the French volunteers did not like this. So we, we would have to take a swab of their, their anal microbiome, and they really had a problem with this. Um, bats didn't seem to care, but the volunteers didn't like to look. But what we found, what we did was we took a sample from young, middle-aged, and old bats. We did a whole metabarcoding analysis of the bacteria that was present. And what we found is that their microbiome didn't change with age. Again, they seemed to find these ways to maintain homeostasis. They didn't change with age, like a dozen us, like a dozen mice. They also had this preponderance of these really pathogenic bacteria. And when you look at other microbiome studies, this seems to be a signature of bats. What that means, I don't know. But the reality is we were looking at each different biomarker on its own. And aging is a holistic thing. So we need a much more integrative approach. And the integrative approach was really the idea of this blood transcriptome. And you think about blood circulates around all of the organs and that's why you find these escaped transcripts from kidney and heart and lung and so forth in blood and so what we had to do is we had to try and say okay i cannot take more than 140 microliters of blood from these bats or they're going to die like it's, it's reverse vampire and so what we had to do is we see could we sequence the entire transcriptome and have enough coverage from less than 140 microliters of blood and that's from an adult you can only take the equivalent of 10% of their body weight. And with some of our babies, we could take no more than 40 to 80 microliters of blood. So, again, brilliant PhD student, now postdoc in my lab, Wang Zhuzha, worked on optimizing 
the methods to be able to sequence the entire blood transcriptome. And we worked it out. And what you need to do is really, there's loads of RNAs in blood, so the blood has to be flash frozen so quickly. We have this capture assay to remove some of these high copy transcripts you find in blood. We designed an assay to sequence the entire blood transcriptome. And we wanted to ask the question is, when you looked at the blood, we wanted to sequence all the blood transcriptome. We also wanted to look at the micro RNAs that were also found in this blood transcriptome, so, so in the blood. And the idea is we want to look at, okay, what happens? What are the age-related transcriptional changes that occur in bats? And then we want to look at the microRNAs which regulate this transcription and see could we uncover what were the mechanisms that maybe regulated the signature we're going to see? And could maybe we explain this adaptation of this extended longevity and health span in bats? Now, this took a long time. So we had samples with over 100 transcriptomes for bats aged zero years of age up to eight years of age. We wanted to look at all of the genes that were expressed in this transcription. And we, wanted, we, we, we looked at basically 12,000 genes that we could find in all of them. We wanted to look at this weighted gene co-expression network analysis to look at which were all the genes that were expressed together. What are the pathways that you find being expressed together? I wanted to then do an enrichment analysis to work out what are the genes, what are the pathways that bats are increasing the regulation of these pathways as they age or decreasing them. Then we want to look at these myrnomes. So again, you had to do a different library. We want to see could we find, be able to correlate the expression of these microRNAs with the pattern we were seeing from the other transcripts. What did we find? So this is bats. And these are zero to seven plus years of age. And it's plus because that bat was caught as an adult and then caught six years later. So what you find is that the real transcriptional difference, when you look at the variance in the transcripts expressed, it's as you would expect. It's between being a baby and then being an adult. So between zero and one or zero to two, you found the most amount of changes. But after that, there was little to no change in their overall transcriptional um, variance. Now, if you, if you compare this to what you see in a mouse, something that's a similar size, you can see, so in the colors, there's the different age cohorts. You can see there's a huge change. So again, it looked like bats were not experiencing this level of dysregulation that we might see. But in the level of variance we saw, what was happening? So we were lucky because in 2018, a study came out in Nature Communications whereby they had, again, looked at the blood transcriptome in humans right across our age because you need to compare the same tissue type if we want to compare across species. They looked at human and they looked at mice. And then we had a study on wolves, which is but a much, much smaller sample size. And we wanted to see, well, when we looked at we, the genes that we found that were upregulated or downregulated in the bats, how did they compare with other species? And in red means that they really increase their regulation with age. In blue means they decrease it. And what we find is when you look at these pathways, you find that what bats really are doing, the real signature that stands out, is that they increase the maintenance of their DNA as they age. So they are, they are maintaining and repairing their DNA. And you can see it's very, very different to human or mice. Ours decreases. What you find is that, as you can see, mice then the end become really, really inflamed as they age, whereas bats and the humans were not. Now, again, you always want to know when you do a project, is the way that I'm looking at aging, can we actually find any longevity signatures? What we found that was very interesting is that when you look at the transcriptional regulation and how it changed, at the transcripts in bats and how they change with age, what we found is that bats were expressing known longevity signatures. So if you want to make a lab mouse live longer, if you look at that purple gene, gene P10, well, you can see that it's increasing its expression as the bats are aging. To make a lab mouse live longer, you put a second copy of P10 into that mouse. For example, look at MYC. To make a lab mouse live longer, you make it downregulate its expression of MYC. So the bats have evolved known life extension mechanisms. And what that means is that the methods work. Crazy field methods are actually working, that we can uncover longevity signatures. But as somebody said to me, 
So what? We know this. We know that's what you do. What this means is that some of the other signatures that we see are potentially longevity signatures. So when you look at these eight known aging genes, so candidate aging genes, and I wanted to look at the exp a very different aging expression profile in bats versus humans. You can look at all these genes here. So we found that they definitely are expressing these known aging candidate genes in a different way to us. But we also found new ones. We found new genes. Now what these genes are, the top 21 of the most high level of, the high correlation of expression with age in bats, and then the bottom 21 of the um, high level of low, and as they age, they decrease their expression. So all of these genes are potential new candidate genes. But what's interesting is typically they're in the pathways of known aging genes. And so that's not that difficult to tweak. So these are places that we need to look to try and see, can we some sl somehow slow down the aging process? We then also looked at a whole series of these microRNAs. And again, we correlated the expression of the microRNAs of the transcripts. We came up with matched microRNAs that looked like they were regulating this transcriptional signature. And so we have a whole bunch of candidate microRNAs that are potentially regulating those longevity signatures that we see in bats. And if you want to do any translational research, that's where you need to go. We've been working with bat genomes at the moment. I'll tell you a little bit about that. And we've actually developed methods in the lab to now go in and biologically validate A, that what we're saying is a microRNA really is, as in it's going to act as some type of regulatory function. And what we need to do now is to try and really validate, are they really regulating those transcripts that we see from our correlative expression studies. So we're at that stage at the moment. But to do this, we also need to have lots and lots of bat cells. Because what we've also found, when you just do the in silico look, it looks like the bat microRNAs are not necessarily able to regulate the same genes as their equivalent uh, human microRNAs do. So we have to really explore that better. But just to think about, well, what, what are the bats doing? If we bring this all together, it looks like as they age, they increase their ability to repair their DNA. They're able to remove damage. They increase their level of autophagy as they age. The longest lived bats are also maintaining their telomeres. And they seem to show this balanced immunity. And you can even see it in the transcripts. They have a matched level of inflammatory and anti inflammatory transcripts. And potentially, this is modulated by microRNAs. But it's not the only thing, because we didn't have a one-to-one -one correlation between our transcripts and the microRNAs. We're also now looking at long non coding RNAs as well. But what we have to do, and anybody, so you can go in the field, catch all your samples. You say, here, we think this is what's driving this unique signature. We now know what the signature is. You have to validate it. And genomic data isn't enough. The field data isn't enough. We need to now go into the lab and to validate this. I need to be able to find ways to get more macrophages, more immune cells. Potentially, the fibroblasts might work as immune cells, but we need to be able to deliver the LPS and poly-IC more. We need to test these hypotheses. Do the signatures we see in their DNA repair mechanisms, is that somehow stopping them getting cancer? We need to test to see how easy is it to make a bad cell have cancer. So we need to move into this field a bit more now to validate this. Just to show you an example that it works, so these were cells that we took from known aged bats, working with Pipistrellus cooley, which is a, a shorter lived Vespertiana bat, with the Myotis myotis, which is the long lived Vespertiana bat, and with the mouse. And what we did is we grew the cell lines, we grew the fibroblasts in our lab, and we then starved them, which induces autophagy. It's a, pro it's a proxy for autophagy. And we wanted to see, we wanted to measure this. Uh, level of basal flux, this autophagic flux quantification to see where they, as where older cells, were they capable of having a more, I suppose, a ferocious autophagy effect. And what did we see? What you see is that in these bats, in Cooley, you can see this really, their autophagy does, in the lab, in the cells, increase with age. But myotis myotis is not quite as um, skewed, but you got to remember, our oldest bat there is, is 10 years of age, or it's not, it's 8 years of age. And these bats live way longer, whereas with Pipitrius cooley, 
That's the known lifespan of these bats that we have samples from. So we took samples, wing punches, from these individuals of known age. We grew them in the lab. We tested them. But as you see in mice, they don't. So their autophagy doesn't increase with age. What's really interesting is that when we then correlate this, and this is all unpublished data, with when we look at the overall expression change with age of these transcripts that are involved in autophagy, you can see in the myotis myotis bats, you can still see a signature as they age, their ability or the transcripts associated with autophagy are increasing. So these are lots of different ways to try and get to the point that autophagy must be important somehow. But we need to take this to the next level. This autophagic flux really isn't, it's just a proxy for it. It's not a true examination. But to do this again, we need more cells. The other thing is that there's 1,400 species of bats. Jerry Wilkinson just published a paper whereby they went and they used a big macroecology study and they coalesced back to the bat ancestor. And they argued that the ancestral bat potentially lived two, year, two times longer than would be expected. And that there's recurrent bouts of longevity along different lineages. And the idea is what I want to do is I want to do the same thing. And this is, again, if you remember Steve Ousted's paper of these are the, the bats that are living way longer than expected in red or bats. I want to go do the same thing in shorter-lived bats versus longer-lived bats and see, do we see the same signature? A pilot study, when we're looking at the molossus molossus, which is bat five that's down there doing what's expected, is that they show a really, really different aging signature. That you do not see that enrichment for DNA repair mechanisms in the molossus molossus bats as they age. But again, just having myotis myotis versus molossus molossus is not enough. We need to look across the spectrum. We also need to look at their genomes. And so I've been driving this, I suppose, it's a whole consortium of people that are dedicated to sequencing the genome of every living bat species, all 1,400 to chromosome level assembly. And the idea is that we want to try and have these exquisite reference genomes. The reason why any of the phylogenetic and phylogenomic evolutionary history reconstruction took so long, if anybody here is working with mammal genomes out there, you realize they're not good. They were, they're rubbish. We have probably 48 reference ones now, and really only a handful of our human mice and some of our domestic species are good enough for us to be able to do the analysis that people are doing with flies, with human, and with mice. And as zoologists in the biology department, what I really want to do is look at non-model organisms, which is the bats. So why not go and generate them ourselves? So we came together, a group of people, Sonia Vernies, myself, we want to try right now the genomes that we have. Only 0.1% of bat diversity has even a genome scan. So we wanted to improve that. So Sonia Vernies, she's the founding director with myself. We have Jean Myers from the Max Planck in Germany, who was one of the creators of shotgun sequencing. How you did it, the mathematician behind it. We have Michael Hiller, David Ray, and Liliana. We're all the executive committee. We have a wonderful group, a steering committee. And we have 300 members of the consortium. And we've written our white paper, and the idea is that we want to sequence this genome to uncover this wonderful biological adaptations and mechanisms that bats have. And if we want to take it to the next level, this is what we have to do. So the way we want to do it is we want to sequence the 21 bat families, followed by the genera, followed by the species. Our pilot study is in review in nature right now. We have six bats. Fingers crossed that Henry G. will be happy with us. And our phase one is funded, but this costs money, no matter what it costs money. And, and we need to come together and think, well, how are we going to raise this money? It's very important to sequence this. This is like a, I suppose, modern state of zoology, where rather than having things in jars, we're going to have genomes that everybody can use. And I need you guys. I need lots of people involved with this. Please sign up. Look at our website. If you want access to these genomes right now, we have six reference quality genomes that anybody can look at and use. And so I hope I've convinced you that bats are really extraordinary species. When you think about it, they're the only mammal that flies. They potentially evolve very unique immune mechanisms. They use echolocation. We didn't talk about their ecosystem services, but again, think about it. There'd be no tequila if there wasn't bats. They pollinate major pollinators in the tropics, and they also regulate all our insects here um, in this part of the world. 
And also they're very important for trying to understand the aging process. And so all species are important, but bats have all of these different attributes. And I want to just say thank you to all of my collaborators from all around the world who, without all of their help and their brilliant insight, we couldn't do this, and also specifically to my own lab. And thank you guys for listening to me. Okay, the first question is, what for they live so long? Um, because, you know, uh, well, uh, the, 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 the aim of natural selection not to provide you with a long life, just to produce more progeny than your neighbor. Well, do, do, okay. It's really what for? And this makes the assumption that there is some type of evolutionary benefit to aging. But that's a different question. If you think about bats, they're only having one baby every year. And so for them to replace themselves, they're going to have to have at least, so they're going to have to live long enough to be able to have and enough babies. Just one baby? Yes. All bats? The majority of bats, one species has twins. And it's really, really rare. But you have to think about it because they have to, the, the limitations that they have to fly while pregnant. Yeah. And a baby will be a third of the body ah, weight yeah. of the female. And that even in some bats, what they'll do is they will have, some of them will have a baby only every second year. Yeah. And so these are the temperate bats. And so uh, this is a restriction. So I think that they're not like mice, where they yeah, have I lots see, and lots I and lots see. of them. They have evolved a very different life history when, strategy. When, when they have menopause? Never. Do they have? No. no. So study done by, now you can't generalize, it's 1,400 yeah, species. Yeah, yeah. But the study done by Roger Ransom yeah. on those horseshoe bats is that the female, so she's, her, she's 24, she's a, this one has had a baby every single year of her life. And she was an adult when she came to that colony. And no, fine, it doesn't look sick, no ill and effects. Males? The males keep mating. The, the Brant's bat, the yeah. cotton Siberia, um, that was a male. And so depending on, so the work done by Gerald Kurt, there isn't a gender difference in how long they live for. In Siberia, it was interesting that they were, the, old, the longest of bats were the males. Now, whether or not that's because they found the bachelor roost, which is when they, they know where the males are hibernating. So again, the other thing that will limit us with, it, with this is that you need, to, with the females, they come back to the same place, have their babies every year. So you can catch them that way. Yeah. Okay. So the, uh, the, 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 the primary reason they just start to fly. Is it? That, 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 that's the beginning of the story. They start to fly. And all the rest is consequence. What about birds? Well, the parallels between uh, birds and birds. That is a brilliant question. And if you look at birds, so there's 10,000 birds. Yeah. And they have had flight for much longer. Yeah. And the one thing, so there was a study done by Kevin Healy in University College Dublin and Trinity, uh -huh. where they looked at a macroecological study. And they tried to say, well, what can predict, what correlates with lifespan? And they had bats and they had birds and every single yeah. thing. And they found the only thing that can predict lifespan is flight. Having wings allows you to live longer. Now, is this simply because you can escape your predators, then you can evolve the maintenance of self, you only have to have one baby a year? Or is it because there's some mechanistic consequence of flight? Yeah. Now, what, to be able to answer that question better, what you need to do then, at least with the birds, You've got short-lived birds. You've got birds that are living way less than expected. But then you'd assume that the ancestor, assuming flight has originated once in aves, you're going to assume that it was long-living. So what you need to do is we need to, we need to, we need to do this phylogenetic independent contrast with long-lived bats and shorter-lived bats, with long-lived birds and shorter-lived birds, and see, do they show the same signatures? Now, we've looked at the genome a bit to do this. And it doesn't look like they've evolved all the same mechanisms. So it's much more complicated. But the likes of the telomeres, parrots are doing something really weird with their telomere genes. So I proposed to the European Research Council to do this. No, they didn't fund me. But I, I think this is something that we need to do, that, or I need to work with the bird biologists who, I mean, these guys have been ringing those birds for 60, 70 years. And, and you really do have amazing micro capture projects with birds. So I think we could do that with birds as well. Okay, that's another parallel between birds and bats that they get rid of the most of the genome. Yes. Do they? Yes. I, I know more or less thanks to uh, Dennis what's go, what what what's happened with the uh, bird genome. Yeah. What happened with uh, bat genome? That's a brilliant question. <laughs> so, so what they get rid of? 
It looks like transposable elements. Yeah. But this, so we've looked at, so their genomes are, they're typically 2GB, like yeah. a bird, yeah. right? They're very like a bird. Yeah. And they're the smallest of all the mammal genomes. Uh -huh. And the, what we've looked at, they're ranging in size from 1.7 to about 2.4. Uh -huh. And the longer, the shorter lived bat has a bigger genome. Now, this yeah. is just a correlation, we don't know. Yeah. When we look at what's in them and we compare them to the other mammals, they have reduction in the transposable elements. Uh -huh. Now, but this is not that simple, though, and I don't know if I really understand it properly, because if you look at the Vespertilionid bats, the long, long-lived ones, they are the only mam mammalian family alive now that has these active rolling transposable elements. Oh, so right. they are still producing these, but yet their genomes are staying small. So this would suggest they must have evolved mechanisms to constantly remove transposable yeah. elements. And so... David Ray thinks that this transposable elements allows for all this plasticity that maybe you might see in the family of bats, the phylostomids, the vampires, and the fruit. Um, but I don't know yet. So this is what we're, we're now looking at that, where the transposable elements go. Do what we see with the telomeres in those myotis, myotis bats, is that a consequence of having to deal with all these transposable elements? They have those cut and paste and move around and copy and paste transposable elements. Still active. 40 million years ago, it stopped in all other mammals. They also have this ability to maintain the length of their telomere, so it looks like they've had to revolve mechanisms to repair DNA. Is that driven by transposable elements? So we're asking that question. Thank you, thank you very motivation speaker. Really, uh, I'm going to drink a lot of green tea after your lecture. <laughs> Irish whiskey, hell of a green tea. <laughs> okay, <laughs> after Brexit. Uh, <laughs> my question is, uh, you uh, talk mostly about bats. What about other animals, other species with long, with long longevity? Uh, mammals, uh, birds, uh, turtles, and so on, so on. Are there any same mechanism of aging? So, when... So the, the other mammal that they've studied aging a lot in is this naked mole rat. And they look like they've evolved different mechanisms. So their telomeres, I think they do shorten. They um, show this heightened level of inflammation. They, but the one thing, if you look at it, it's not the same genes, but it seems to be the same. They, they're involved in anti-cancer. So the anti-cancer in the naked mole rats, and there's anti-cancer in bats. So you see selection of these DNA repair genes. But they have that hyaluronic acid that you don't see in the bats. And so I think that, and, but the consequence maybe is, is anti-cancer. So maybe the bats have evolved different repair mechanisms, but the result is anti-cancer. So you might see the same thing. The tortoises, I, I don't know about the tortoises or all of the rest of those, but they're a wonderful things to do. But maybe we need to look at really short-lived things, like a killifish. What's going on? So in some of these fish where you've got a really long-lived fish and if a sister tax a very short-lived fish, it's transposable elements. You know, that, that's the difference. But it's the other way around. It's the transposable elements. If they increase, it means it's bad for longevity. So we do need to look across other tax, and we need to all work together in a comparative framework. But if we're going to do it, you have to be able to take the samples out, and we need the genomes. Uh, thank you for interesting lectures. It's uh, amazing lectures. It's uh, really very interesting. I have one question. Uh, you said about innate immune system in said um, bats um, differs increased uh, anti-inflammatory response, but uh, and link it um, with increased resistance to viruses and pathogens. Right? It's right. I don't know if I. So no, I don't know what you've asked. Uh, Maybe, I, maybe. I won't uh, ask you. I want to ask you: uh, Is there any difference um, in adaptive immune response between bats and mice? I have no idea. I don't know. Um, they do have antibodies. Um, they're 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 interfering. So the strange things is that now people are now there's a big gap in knowledge in what's going on in bats and Lin Fa Wang's group in Singapore has been looking at this. But it's all at the at the innate immune response. When you look at the adaptive immune response, you look at genes. Just for example, that you would see, like they're tall like receptors. That wouldn't be that. They're they're all the same. Okay, so when you look at the genes, they're not that different. There's not that much selection. We need to look at the overall results. You will find when they, 
they will have antibodies to Ebola, for example. They do have that. Um, with When they try and infect them with rabies, again, sometimes they will mount antibodies to rabies if they're injected with a small enough amount of rabies. Um, but the question is, is that because they got those antibodies from their mother and that they have this memory, or is it because bats can deal with rabies? There's other studies are done where if they inject the rabies into their head, they die. Um, so I don't know of a, a study that really says they're really, really different in this way. So I think what you're going to have to do is you'd have to match them. You'd have to have maybe why I'm not sure even how you do it. But for me, I can look the innate immune maybe it's easier to deal with at the moment. But it's a good question. Uh, does the, all of the groups of bats have a long lifespan? And if not, uh, what is the difference uh, in mechanism? So you think he has to, or do all the bats have, show this longevity? Do they all have longer lifespan? So with the marker capture projects that we've done, it looks like the majority of bats are living way longer than expected. There is one species that we know is living shorter. Now, people sometimes argue a bit. So some of the field biologists say, the only reason why you don't see molossus molossus living longer is because you haven't done the right study. That, 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 that um, potentially we can't find the older ones. So just evidence of not finding them doesn't mean they can't do it. Now, I would disagree because this is a long, ongoing study in Panama, and they've never found them. But then if you think about how long do they have to live for? That means that each ba each uh, each female, so she's going to have to live. How long is she going to have to live to replace herself and the father? That means that there and the population isn't decreasing, and so that means that they're going to have to have uh, the baby's going to have to survive. All the babies are going to have to survive all of the time. Now we see still 50% of of so what will happen is in our myotis myotis bats, half of the babies do die the first year. But any of them, if they get past the first year, they're fine. They die because of a cold spring. They die because they didn't get fat enough. They die because they're eating the wrong food rather than having age-related mortality. So what we've seen, so the one that I've studied, one of the shorter-lived bats, is the molasses molasses, allegedly. When we sequence the blood transcriptome of young versus older ones, and the old ones would be four, we found that they don't show that DNA repair mechanism signature like we do with the myotis myotis. But there's only two we've looked at. So you need to have more along the whole spectrum. When we look within the genome, we've looked along different lineages. You don't see anything that different yet. So again, I'm still thinking now it's not coding genes. It's the regulation. And that's what we need to look at. Because I'm tired looking at protein coding genes. They're, they're, they're conservative. They're conserved all the time. And then you see one single mutation. And it's, but maybe that's how selection works. Uh, as Renika relates with, I don't know, lifestyle, ecology, and longevity. Yeah, so that, that's an, you know, so do you find that, okay, so just because it's a myotis, myotis bat, so if it's found in different parts of the world, would it have different longevities? And you see, because I was just rereading that the paper that was the, the, the longevity record for the Siberian bat, and they found that in some places, the myotis branti will only live eight years. That's their record. And then in other places, they're living over 41 years. Now, what makes the 41 years much better? And potentially there could be, so they, they have some studies that there, there may be more optimal environments for these bats to live in. And so, again, if the weather is bad and if there's changing climate, they don't do so well. I thought about like you know there's vampires, oh, yeah. pollinators, yeah. and uh, you know insectivores. Yeah. Well, are there any difference, uh, systematic or it's not? The longest lived genera are the temperate insectivores. Ah. So they're the myotis. They're all the Vespertianans. They're the ah. myotis bats, and then you have the rhinolophids. So typically, it's the, now the question is: Is this because where the longest lived marker capture studies have happened oh. have been in you know temperate uh, Europe yeah, yeah, or, yeah. or here, or is it because, and the thing is what we really need to do is we need to study the bats in the tropics, but they're hard to study. And there's two species, so there's three species of vampires. There's uh, Diphila, Diemus, and Desmodus. And what you see with those guys is that you have the Desmodus live up to 19 years of age, and the Diemus only lives till about eight. And they're the same weight. 
in a similar environment. So that's a, a, that would be a good study to do. So we're looking into that now to see can you could the ecology explain it a bit better. Uh, thanks for your lecture. Uh, is there any probability that uh, <clears throat> we can improve uh, humans' lifespan uh, by using the knowledge of uh, bad mechanisms? You see, I think. Let them fly. Well, I think there is. <laughs> well, if you think about it, so the question is, what would you do with all of this? You know, how do we make it work? So initially, I thought, okay, I'm going to CRISPR a you know bat gene into a human. I'm going to do all of these other things. And then you realize, actually, you don't need to do any of that. It's quite simple. Is that you would just need to modulate the pathways. And so they're similar pathways. So drugs can do this. Think of what aspirin does. It lowers your inflammation. Think about what metformin does. Metformin is this diabetic drug that all the Americans are taking right now because it's, it correlates with, for some reason, they were given to diabetics, type 1 diabetics, and all of a sudden all of their biomarkers of aging really improved. But they don't yet know What's the side effect? What they're also doing is so things that you learn, you can, we can modulate this. Rapamycin is also another drug. It's an antibiotic that, again, has been shown, because what it does, it mimics starvation. And this has been known to, to, to lengthen life, but humans can't starve, they hate it. And also it's not good. So to have the benefit, beneficial effects of these side effects. So they're working on that now. And I know they're doing a lot of the stuff with the naked mole rat. But to get to that stage, so the work they're doing, and I use the naked mole rat as an example, so they have 20 years of studying. They realize that they produce that hyaluronic acid. And they now are making these mice that can produce it. And then they're going to see, are those mice more cancer resistant? And if that's the case, then you can make a drug that mimics that effect. You've got the same genes. You've got the same pathways. I gave a talk at this meeting in, in Switzerland at Davos. And this guy, I gave a talk about the microRNAs. And this guy came up to me and he goes, I have a company that makes microRNAs. Let's talk. I'm like, do you want to fund the genomes? So potentially, yes. I believe so. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, can I put it in the web? You were telling me you were recording. Huh? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay.